Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. While U.S. troops continue to withdraw from Afghanistan to comply with the total withdrawal deadline in August, the Taliban has succeeded in capturing more and more regions in Afghanistan. Some fear that soon the Taliban will overthrow the internationally backed government in Kabul as well. Moreover, civilian casualties in Afghanistan have reached numbers not seen since 2001. So far in 2021, approximately 1,600 individuals have been killed, a 47% increase since 2020. Despite tensions rising between the United States, Russia, China, and Pakistan, many predict that the U.S., no matter how precarious the situation in Afghanistan gets, will not be able to re-enter the war zone that they have occupied for the past two decades. The reality then is that with no international forces present and Russia and China working to actively prevent the presence of United States, Afghanistan will become a terrorist incubator and the citizens of the nation will live in political unrest and conflict long into the future. Joining us to discuss this further is Kamran Bukhari, the Director of Analytical Development at the News Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy in Washington. He is also a national security slash foreign policy specialist at the University of Ottawa's Professional Development Institute. Thank you for joining us today, Cameron. It's wonderful to have you. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. All right. So right off the bat, I guess I'm going to start with President Biden. And I'm going to quote him as he said, it's the right and responsibility of the Afghan people alone to decide their future and how they want to run their country. However, the U.S. has also stated that it will continue to deploy airstrikes in support of Afghan troops. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I've actually been one of those people who've been uh, calling on the Biden administration to not take uh, the airstrikes op uh, option and the, the air support uh, to the Afghan government off the table. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, the United States has, even though it's withdrawn, it can still help with airstrikes. And that's what's going to make a difference because at the end of the day, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, the Taliban have not been able to take on major urban centers because uh, of the airstrikes uh, vulnerability. In order to take on these uh, big cities and towns, you need to uh, amass a large number of fighters. And the Taliban knew that they're, if they did that, they would be vulnerable to airstrikes and they could lose all that human resource. So they never did, uh, mobilized those mass, uh, those fighters or that task force, that large task force needed to take on or at least try to take on some major urban center, which is mm -hmm. why they're still a rural phenomenon, a suburban phenomenon. And uh, that needs to continue because right now the Taliban think that, okay, uh, we have an opportunity to militarily push ahead. And uh, the, without the air support, uh, they could push ahead. And the goal here is to force them to the table. Now, you can't force them to the table unless they feel that there's a, they can only come this far and no further militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to shape that perception, you need to be able to make sh demonstrate to them that, look, uh, this isn't the 90s where you could just steamroll into Kabul. And speaking of the Taliban, they're, they're making more gain in Afghanistan. So do you think the U.S. should be reconsidering their choice to pull out of Afghanistan? No, I think we're done. I mean, uh, I wrote a piece four years ago, a little over four years ago, on uh, predicting basically that, you know, things have come to a point where it's only a matter of time where the U.S. says, you know, this is as much as we could do while in country. And, uh, you know, besides, since 2014, uh, the U.S. has been progressively pulling forces out. And even, you know, with what the Biden administration is doing, they're only pulling, you know, a residual force of a few thousand people who weren't doing combat operations. So I don't think that it should go back in. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, uh, this is no longer America's war. This is a war for between the Afghan sides, and they need to find their path towards peace. What the U.S. should and continue to do is um, support the Afghan government to the extent that's possible, financially, diplomatically, militarily, as I mentioned, through airstrikes, and basically hold the, the Taliban feet to the fire to say, look, if you want international recognition, 
if you want to be part of you know a ruling structure if you tomorrow you want to be able to have uh, a huge stake of governance in uh, the country mm -hmm. you got to play by the rules you can't militarily uh, forcibly through you know uh, the, through the barrel of the gun come to power you have to come to power through a negotiated settlement right and so that leverage is there and i think that's what the us should be doing i mean in fact I think that the, the U.S. should have never gotten into uh, the b business of nation building uh, because that's not what we do. Uh, that's not anybody can do. Uh, we the the mission uh, was accomplished a long time ago, which was the destruction of Al Qaeda, uh, the facilities and the headquarters in the country. And after that, uh, the United States should have just sort of said, OK, let's keep working on the political front but we don't need to to be fighting other people's war and i think that the distraction to iraq uh which was a costly one uh, had that not been the case i really believe the taliban would not be in a position that they are right now say hypothetically if the u.s does reconsider their decision what are the chances that they will be allowed to re-enter afghanistan oh the united states can re-enter afghanistan i mean it did in the past it's, it's who's going to stop you know uh, mm. there's nobody to stop you know the pot uh, the it's the United States decided to go in. The mission wasn't very clear, and naturally so, because 9-11 had happened, and there was a need to make sure that the entity that attacked the United States did not have the wherewithal to do it again. Uh, but, you know, along the, uh, you know, along the, you know, over the years, along the way, we, we lost sort of the clarity of what the mission should be, got distracted by Iraq, but there was nobody to say uh, that leave or stay um that was a u.s decision and if the u.s comes back i suspect what is going to happen is not going to come back in a major way the united states will you know let's say god forbid you know isis becomes a thing or aq becomes a thing or some other terrorist entity that we're not talking about today emerges and there's a need for the united states to come in with a limited time operation like what we did in iraq and syria uh you know we pulled out of iraq in uh, at the end of 2011 and then we had to redeploy about 5,000 or so troops after 2014 when ISIS seized Mosul, the, the second largest city of Iraq, and declared the so-called caliphate. So I foresee that kind of coming back. Uh, but then again, it may or may not happen. But I really don't think that the United States is going to deploy a multidivisional force in the country uh, again. Why do you think President Biden claimed that he is following through with an agreement that his predecessor, Donald Trump, made with the Taliban? Why not own up to his own choice to leave? Well, because the, this isn't uh, something that the President Biden got to decide. So, uh, I mean, it was a decision. I mean, you look at what was happening when he was last in office as VP to President Obama. Mm. Uh, there were negotiations that were going on. They just didn't uh gain momentum at the time right and he left the office in 20 uh in at the end of 2016 mm -hmm. and uh then it was there was no uh negotiation that was so you know rapidly advanced uh in fact i would argue that and I, I'm, I'm on record of criticizing the the trump administration uh for fast tracking a peace deal i wrote it in bloomberg and in the wall street journal uh, that look, this this isn't how uh, you know uh, this isn't the right thing to do because you're going to leave a lot of uh, unfinished business behind. Uh, the negotiation uh, requires far more, uh, if you will, uh, time to to mature and materialize. So I think that's what the president is talking about, saying, look, you know, this is the hand that I was dealt. I didn't make that decision, but I did get elected, and I have to pick up from where my predecessor left off, which is the case with every president uh, that comes to power. With the international troops leaving Afghanistan, what do you think that the future of Afghanistan will look like? Pretty bad. Um, I mean, it's, look, uh, this is a country that has been at war with itself uh, for 40 years, uh, and we're just entering a new chapter of that very, very long civil war. Some people think civil war is now about to begin or will happen, uh, you know. Uh, but for me, I, you know, I look back and I say this war started in '79 uh, or '78 uh, by some accounts. So 
where this is sort of the normal for the country, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm really hoping that unlike in the past, the 20 years of US investment in blood and treasure uh, would not have been in vain. In other words, I'm really counting on the anti-Taliban factions to represent uh, you know, a, a, a force of resistance to the Taliban may not be good. They may not control, you know, they may not be able to, to defeat, they're not going to defeat the Taliban, uh, but they're not going to be sort of pushed aside. Uh, again, this isn't the 90s uh, or, 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 you know, decades past. Uh, right now you have a vibrant civil society. Uh, people, not everybody has the luxury to leave. Uh, and yes, people are fleeing. Uh, and, and more people will flee. But I think there's a strong incentive for people to stand their ground and fight. And that's why uh, the United States and, and uh, other partners and, and other regional actors need to be able to support the Afghan government. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that everybody realizes this. The Iranians realize that. I think the Pakistanis realize that as well. Uh, though uh, they have an uphill task to basically uh, prove to the anti-Taliban factions that they are no longer uh, wanting the Taliban to come to power. And they say, you know, uh, actions speak louder than words. So the Pakistanis have to prove this. And I was just in coming off of a, another conversation here in Washington where I my idea was that, look, if the Pakistanis support the Afghan uh, government or the anti-Taliban factions, militarily with some assistance that will go a long way in telegraphing to the anti-taliban factions that look we haven't gotten along and we've you know in, in over the last 20 years but we really mean it that you know when we say we don't want the taliban to dominate a post-american afghanistan so it's it's putting your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. Do you think the U.S. and international troops more broadly fail the people of Afghanistan by withdrawing? Who do you think is suffering the most from this decision? Well, look, I mean, obviously the, the people who are going to suffer most are the Afghans themselves. Uh, but they're smart enough to know that uh, there are no free lunches in the world. And, and, and they're very intelligent people. And they knew that this day would come. And um, they may not have thought in detail about it, but it's not like it comes as a surprise to them. Uh, they may have thought they had more time. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, they got their first jolt when, uh, as I said, Trump rushed that deal with the Taliban. And then they got the second jolt when uh, President Biden basically signaled that uh, we're pulling out uh, first, you know, on September 11. And then it was the end of August. So, yes, the, there are surprises, but I don't think it's a complete surprise. So I think that they uh, they know what needs to be done. They have, a, you know, a, a lot of hard work to do. Uh, in the end, yeah, look, no nation can uh, can support another nation indefinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we United States deployed forces in many areas around the world and pulled out. There are places that they're still there. Uh, but those strategic reasons, uh, are, you know, outweigh the, the, the option to pull out. So I'm talking South Korea, uh, for example. There's a completely different situation over there. So, but it isn't like, look, the U.S. is not in country. The U.S. is not leaving uh, in the sense that it's not going to sort of just say, okay, uh, nice knowing you. That's not happening. That's, yeah. The U.S. is repositioning itself. And we're in an age where, you know, look, we don't need to uh, be in country to be able to prevent uh, extremists and terrorists from using that country as a launch pad. And we, there's a lot we can achieve through technology and through air power and through the power of the purse. Mind you, if the Taliban are supposed to govern this country, mm -hmm. they need money. They're not going to grow it on trees. And the Afghan economy is utterly dependent on international financial aid. There isn't a viable political economy in the country as of right now, and it'll take years to develop that. So if the Taliban want to do business and they want to be seen as a legitimate international player, then they know what to do. 
The Afghan Foreign Ministry says that the Afghanistan ambassador's daughter was kidnapped and tortured in Pakistan. However, Pakistan's interior minister has claimed that there is no evidence to suggest that she was kidnapped. Rather, she had simply disappeared. Why do you think that there is a discrepancy in their accounts of what happened? And which account do you find more compelling? Look, it's a fact that she was, uh, you know, abducted. Uh, and, you know, it's a fact that she was tortured. Uh, and what the interior minister of Pakistan is smoking, only he can tell. Uh, and so uh, at, at the end of the day, I mean, I don't take these statements seriously, especially mm -hmm. from characters like Sheikh Rashid, who have or known for, you know, their idiosyncrasies, to put it mildly. Um, and so, look, at the end of the day, I see it as, as follows. Uh, there is a clear shift on the part of at least the top layer of the Pakistani military and intelligence leadership with the army chief and the head of the ISI telling the opposition to, you know, uh, this was something that their ally Imran Khan uh, didn't want them to do. Mm -hmm. But they overrode his decision and went to the opposition in parliament and said, hey, this is what's happening. And uh, the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban are two sides of the same coin. This is you know, a, a huge change in at least the rhetoric of good versus bad Taliban, which was their narrative until recently. So uh, it seems to me that there are forces inside Pakistan who don't like what at least the leadership of the Pakistani military and the ISI is at least talking about, if not, you know, uh, actually doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't want to see, uh, you know, that the Pakistanis creating more of a balance between the Taliban and the anti-Taliban factions. Mm -hmm. So how what what this was a, a strategic way to basically keep those divisions and sustain that bitterness between Kabul and Islamabad uh, by doing this. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Why? What did you get out of that? Mm -hmm. Who, why would anybody do it? And for right. what reason? So I think that there are elements within the Pakistani state and society that are very pro-Taliban who don't want Pakistan to now move to the center, if you will. And this is their way of thwarting that process because the only way to thwart that process is to sustain the suspicion and the bitterness and the acrimony between the anti-Taliban uh, factions and Pakistani state. Speaking of Pakistan, at least, Afghan President Ghani has indirectly condemned them for not doing more to stop the Taliban and other terrorists from crossing the border into Afghanistan. Do you think that his criticism holds true? His criticism is, is valid, uh, but again, you know, there's reality and then there's perception. And we live in a world where perceptions matter more than reality. It really doesn't matter what the reality is. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if an actor believes in certain things, it doesn't have to happen uh, or doesn't have to happen uh, in the same way it used to uh, for them to continue believing it. And that's why I said earlier that uh, the Pakistanis, if they're going to build a trust with the Afghan government and with the anti-Taliban factions, then words won't cut it because the other side has seen a history of Pakistan openly support the Taliban. This same interior minister that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. he's on record from a few days ago acknowledging that, you know, even now, Afghan Taliban uh, leaders and their families uh, enjoy hospitality in the country. Uh, they have homes, they have access to health care, and so on and so forth. So uh, if that's what's happening, it's feeding that narrative, that old narrative that continues to uh, you know, uh, if you will, haunt the anti-Taliban factions, that Pakistan has been firmly in the Taliban camp. And if that perception has to change, then the Pakistanis have to do certain things uh, to demonstrate that, yeah, they're really in the center. Now, what they may be, the Pakistanis, in all fairness to them, may very well be no longer in that position. But if you have spent, you know, 20, 25, 30 years doing something, then you can't expect the world to all of a sudden accept your, take your word for it. You actually have to demonstrate it. 
And I think that that's where we are. What is the danger of the Taliban increasing power in Afghanistan? Well, look, I mean, the most vulnerable country, and I tweeted this a few days ago, is Pakistan, because uh, the, the Taliban enjoys strategic depth in the country. It's kind of ironic. Pakistanis, for the longest time, wanted strategic depth in Afghanistan, which is fair. All countries want strategic depth. But you don't do it with via actors who challenge your own national narrative. Uh, so the Taliban say they're going to establish an Islamic state. But wait a minute. The Pakistani government claims that they're an Islamic Republic. So which one is which? Mm -hmm. And so if the Taliban, it's not like the Taliban are going to just say, oh, Pakistan, you can keep your Islamic Republic on that side of the border. On this side of the border, we want uh, a more pure Islamic government that we're going to establish and we're going to call it the Islamic Emirate. That doesn't work. There's no way that those two can peacefully coexist. And the Taliban do not, are, you know, while they right now they want to be focused on their country, but they have very, very deep relations with the Pakistani Taliban. And the Pakistani Taliban are not, uh, you know, focused on uh, Afghanistan. They're focused mm -hmm. on Pakistan. So after the Afghan people themselves, they're going to they're the ones who are going to suffer the most. I think the, the country that's going to suffer the most is Pakistan because of the porous border, because of the linkages that the Taliban have deep within Pakistani state and society that go back decades. And this is going to be blowback uh, like we have not seen before. How do you think that the future looks like for Afghani women? I would like to believe that, uh, you know, so the risks are there. They are in a very desperate and terrible situation. But I'd like to believe that the Taliban will not overwhelm the other side in a manner where all the gains that we have made with respect to women's rights and the empowerment of women uh, and the ability of women to participate in public affairs in Afghanistan are eroded. So, yes, there are areas that we'll see where the Taliban are active, the rural and the suburban areas where, you know, it'll be very difficult and terrible for women. But in areas that remain outside the reach, and I hope that they remain outside the reach of the Taliban, uh, I really am hoping that it's not going to be all doom and gloom, though even though it may seem that way. And hopefully, you know, uh, my, if you will, gut feeling uh, proves right, but that remains to be seen. Given the fact that civilian casualties are up by 47% from last year, with an estimated 1,600 deaths in 2021 so far, is there anything that the U.S. or other international powers could or should be doing about the situation in Afghanistan? I think, look, um, I think the, in the end, this we're in a war. And the, the Afghan government and the anti-Taliban factions uh, they, the Afghan people, those who do not support the Taliban, and I believe there are a lot of them, they are going to be the ones who are going to do the heavy lifting. What the international community needs to do is make sure that we continue to support them financially, diplomatically, logistically, the use of air power as and when it is needed. Uh, and we just need to make sure that the gains that we made over the last 20 years uh, do, are not just sort of washed away and we can hold on to them and in fact build on them. And I think it's doable. It's gonna take a lot of hard work uh, from all sides. The Afghan people will have to fight for their rights, but it's our job as the international community to make sure they have everything they need in order to be able to successfully wage that struggle. Um, you just said that the gains that we made in the past 20-ish years. So what, if anything, is there to show for the decades-long international presence in Afghanistan? There are, uh, There is a vibrant civil society. Uh, there, The country has seen elections. They're flawed, but that's what happens. Political, economic, social development does not happen in a matter of decades. It's a multi-generational process. So, uh, And the U.S. was never going to be here till you know the uh, afghanistan is uh you know a uh, a stable uh, 
place, uh, a stable political economy. The United States was always going to leave at some point. The question was when. So there were, it was by design, the, the gains would have been partial. So the gains uh, are there and that we need to recognize them. Uh, you know, there are lots of Afghan people who have benefited from the investment that the United States and its NATO allies have made, whether it's militarily, economically, or socially, or otherwise. And people have the pe women are now part of the political elite. They're part of security forces. They're in all walks of life. Just to give you one example, there are a lot of young people who have aspirations and who uh, you know want to see uh, them fulfilled living in their country. Nobody wants to be a refugee by choice. You only become a refugee uh, because you have no other choice. And I'm saying that we've made gains. Those are the gains that I'm talking about. There is a media in that country. Is it under threat? Are, the, are women at risk? Absolutely. But I think that that doesn't take away from the fact that the United States you know, we, we're, it's very convenient for people and critics of the United States do this all the time. And, and I deeply disagree and resent uh, this view that the United States, uh, you know, you, all you're looking at is that, oh, this was like, you know, uh, a failure. This is not a failure. First of all, Al Qaeda does not exist today the way it did uh, as of 9-11. The Taliban want the world to recognize them. They are willing to play ball according to uh, international rules, uh, that did not happen uh, without whatever you, the United States and its allies did. So what I'm saying is everything we did did not produce the ideal results. There are lots of flaws. Afghan security forces are not there where we had hoped them to be. But look, uh, you, you, you plan something and then there are the results of that planning. And that's where we are. So, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of mistakes were made. They shouldn't have been made, but they were made. And there is no process without mistakes. That doesn't mean we throw the baby with the bathwater and we just say, oh, it's a complete loss. And we basically write it off as such. Mm -hmm. That is completely unfair. And I strongly believe on looking at the glass half full as opposed to half empty. Well, speaking of mistakes and unfairness, Afghan nationals who worked for the Canadian government as contractors or interpreters have cited fear for their lives as the Taliban has gained more traction. They also cite abandonment by the Canadian government. So while the federal government has announced that it will resettle these Afghani aides in 2009, the limited criteria for similar resettlement left many people turned away from refuge in Canada. So what should, do you think should be done to help these individuals this time around? So I think that there are a couple of things that need to be done. So obviously, there's a limit to how much we can use immigration uh, as a way to protect these people. So we should, you know, uh, take as many of them in, both in the United States and Canada and our other, you know, partners uh, in, in, among in the West and other countries, uh, but that's just part of it. We can't. No one can possibly take all of these people. Mm -hmm. This is this just not, you know, this is a ridiculous idea. Uh, so what we need to do is to make sure that it is safe for them. Now we may we won't be able to protect all of them because they are already people who live in areas that are within the you know striking distance of the Taliban so unfortunately uh, there's little we can do we should try to do as much as we can to protect those people with the realization that we're not going to be able to protect everybody but then there are areas in which the Taliban as I said have not reached yet let's make sure they don't reach there the, and these people will then have a chance of a good life a productive life and they will have a fighting chance against their enemies uh, i.e. the Taliban. So while the Canadian government has been criticized for moving too slowly to help former employees of the military in Afghanistan, some Canadian veterans have taken matters into their own hands and have used their own funds and resources to rescue these Afghan nationals. Why do you think that the Canadian government is failing to meet its obligation to protect these people? 
So there is an obligation, but then there are resources. We have to be mindful of resources. Uh, the and at, and at the end of the day, everything is political. Governance and politics go hand in hand. If the current government, which is already seen by its conservative critics as doing very little to uh, to protect human rights, uh, and and in the case of Afghanistan, uh, let's say it started to bring uh, a large number of refugees from Afghanistan to Canada. Mm-hmm. The, those same critics are going to say, "Well, you are, uh, you know, jeopardizing uh, the the country because the political economy of this country cannot absorb so many people, and you're setting a bad precedent where you will open the floodgates of immigration." We have a very similar, probably, definitely even more polarized debate here south of the border in the United States. Mm -hmm. So there are limits to what the Biden and Trudeau administration can do, or any administration, doesn't matter whether right now it is Biden and Trudeau, could be anybody tomorrow. And they're going to face the same situation. So yes, people are then, you know, there are veterans who will say, okay, civil society actors will say, well, let's try to use our funds and let's try to help these people uh, as much as possible. What I'm saying is, uh, there's only so much civil society actors can do in Western countries, particularly the United States and Canada. There's only so much the United States and Canadian governments can do in in terms of bringing people over. So there has to be a better comprehensive solution. And that solution is not to just sort of, because if you start to open the floodgates, basically what you said is that, okay, Afghanistan is a lost cause. It's mm-hmm. not and we need to be able to stand the ground we cannot cede territory to the taliban if everybody starts to leave then we would have handed the taliban a victory that they right now are are not necessarily capable of achieving so there there's a need for afghan us to create the safe spaces in afghanistan so that these people can flourish in their own countries and do not become a burden on our political economies, uh, and we have to balance. There is a domestic political imperative, there's a foreign policy imperative. They have to be balanced. And I guess my final question to you is, why should citizens of Canada, or even the United States, care about what is happening in Afghanistan right now? I think they need to care. I think we, we live in a world that we just can't be isolated from. Uh, it's, the world is interconnected in ways that we never imagined only a few years ago. Uh, and so this is a world that, it, this is the same world, and the idea that it's happening over there, and therefore, you know, yes, we have a standoff, a physical standoff from it. Mm-hmm. We're not immediately affected by it. But because of the interconnectedness of the global, you know, uh, global geopolitics, global geoeconomics, uh, we're all in, we're all in this together, and we all have to play our part. And therefore, it is absolutely essential for advanced Western democracies like the United States and Canada and our allies in Europe to actually care about the world. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, uh, we're going to leave it to actors like Russia, to the like actors like Iran, China, Taliban. Uh, do we want to do that? You know, we've built a rules-based order, uh, and that rules-based order uh, has to be maintained. It has to evolve. Uh, there are a lot of pressures on it. Uh, the, the liberal international order that was built after World War II, every system has to go undergo periodic evolution and, and, and improvement. Uh, and so we need to do that. Otherwise, we're just making this place more chaotic. Today is Afghanistan, tomorrow it could be something else. It could be Pakistan. From Pakistan, if Pakistan destabilizes, it's a threat for India. And we're, this is the uh, most heavily populated part of the world. Mm-hmm. You know? And we're talking you know, uh, close to 2 billion people. No, that is, that is absolutely correct. And I want to thank you for joining me and answering my questions. It's, it was great speaking to you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. You're watching the International News Channel on Tag TV. I am Simone Ivani. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications to stay up to date on our latest videos.